Hey, Dylan. Hey, Mike. Dylan? Why the hell would you even want a graphics engine? Uh, so you can have graphics? I mean... Uh, you get do, graphics... Do you not want a game the with graphics? The platform has graphics. The like, platform. Why would you ever want like a framework on top of your framework? Like, we talk about the Sunburn gaming engine Well, you know, time. You, you want but, a framework like, in your framework so you can framework while you framework. Yo, dog. I heard you like framework, so I put a framework in your framework. Framework, so you can <clears throat> framework while you framework. But, um... Because there are some things that XNA doesn't do. It's very low level, especially when it comes to 3D. So, why wouldn't you want a 3D framework on top of XNA if you're doing 3D? So the question here I have is... Why, why would you? Like, what is it What is it buying you? I mean, we, we talk about this all the time, but, like, what are you getting out of the uh, Sunbird gaming engine? Lighting, physics, <clears throat> just... But, I mean, could you not do that on your own? Not necessarily. I mean, why reinvent the wheel? Well, okay, so let's assume you're a moderately decent developer, Okay. Why would you bother, since you can write all this stuff yourself, okay, look up tutorials online, write your own lighting engine, you know how it works now, you can, you know, you, you build your lightsaber, you could take it apart and, and, and fix all the problems and all that. So that's a long way to go. I mean, technically, I could write a lighting engine. I have the capability, but the time and the effort and the, you know, getting from point A well, to point B. How much time and all, effort are we talking about? I don't know. I haven't written a lighting engine. If I had, then, you know. So, so this hypothetical, like, put you, you're the hypothetical now. Okay. You are the hypothetical. I'm the hypothetical. Yeah. You haven't actually written a lighting engine. You think you could, but... There's a I'm very saying it is there. possible. I'm not There's saying a, it, it's it possible, is probable. But you get you hit on a big problem in, in in the analysis here. You don't actually know what it's going to take, right? Right. You haven't gone through and done it, and the time component is is huge. Now you can go out and for free grab the Sunburn framework. You know, there it's free. You know, so your time would be spent on. Understanding that framework a little bit. Asking some questions in the forum, getting it up and running. Um, it is not the Sunburn Gaming Engine. So there's some features the framework doesn't have that the engine does have. You can step up to that later. I mean, one's built on top of the other, so it's not like anything you learn is, is wasted. But even though you could write all this and build all that, you shouldn't. Right? If you need the things in these games, you shouldn't waste your time like you said, reinventing this wheel. And, you know, this extends beyond just sunburn, okay? The XNA framework itself is very awesome because it's pretty low level for a framework, for a framework in, in, in the game sphere, right? Like, usually you get, like, Unreal Engine or Unity, okay? These things are coming out of the box with game physics and, and controllers and, you know, controller support, um, 3D rendering. Like, you get, you get Unreal Engine... Man, you just fire that up, you just start placing some 3D objects, you get a first-person shooter, you know, right out of the box, start dropping in assets, adding things, it's very high level. And XNA is kind of cool because even though it's managed and easy to get into, it's not high level. So you can kind of do what you want, take direct control, um, and when you get too high level, you're kind of locked into their paradigm, their method of doing things. You actually have to work backwards if you want <clears throat> to pull out some of their right. choices. So... It's cool that the XNA framework doesn't do that, but you have all the downsides of now you got to create all those things that you need. You're going to need physics. You're going to need a uh, controller input handle. You're going to need, if you're doing 3D, lighting engines. Dear God, are you going to need a lighting engine if you're doing 3D? So many indie games that we had to review didn't understand that principle, but you need a lighting engine if you're going to do 3D and you're going to at least get decent results. Okay? Um, I mean, if you don't even understand the difference between dynamic and static lighting, if you don't even know how you would begin to render static lighting into your level design, this is not a rabbit hole you want to go down. And on top of that, this is a very performance-intense area. So you could very easily cause performance problems for your game not understanding the full ramifications of the code that you write. 
Because you're you're targeting voodoo magic under the scene. You're you're really going below the X and A level, below the C sharp level. You got to know what that hardware is doing and what that low level system's doing to get it to behave right, so that you can get six thousand static lights done in and loaded fine. That you can get thousands upon thousands of dynamic lights up and running. You know, and you can have all the good effects of a triple A game. And that is really the value of checking something out like the Sunburn Framework, like the Sunburn Engine, is that you need to focus on your game. And yes, you're going to have to spend some time learning to code, learning to get the assets loaded, learning to you know, get the basic frame up. But ideally, that, man, hopefully that's a week for you. You know, if you get a week to sit down with X and A and the framework, I think if you're a competent developer, if you're an experienced developer, if you've even written a game or two in something in the past, um, although I'm going to say not required, but probably helpful, but if you at least kind of have the basic concepts down, and you, you sit down cold to C-sharp, X and A, and then Sunburn Framework, I'm going to say by the end of the week, you're going to have stuff up and going, and you're going to be creating content for your game. It's, it's that easy to get into. It's not a barrier, uh, a huge barrier, a steep climb to, to get into that. And... You know, that one week that you sacrificed there is going to give you years of development time that went into the Sunburn Framework and the Sunburn Engine and the XNA. I mean, we're looking at four or five years for the age of XNA. Granted, it's not updated as frequently anymore, but it, it's been around a while. Its tires have been kicked. Uh, it's built on top of DirectX. You're talking decades worth of development behind DirectX. So, um, <clears throat> leverage all that. And then make your game. Focus on the aspects that are going to make your game fun and unique. Um, so if you want to go download and check this out and, and put this to test, test, just call it Mike's One Week Challenge. Mike's One Week Challenge. Take a week. Go download the Sunburn Framework. Play with it for a week and see where you are at the end of the week. And if you don't, you know, if you don't feel like you've made significant progress, um, if you feel like you're fighting and all that, then, you know, it, no, hey, you, you invested a week. And you tried something out, you know. I've gone down rabbit holes I created myself that were more than a week uh, in time. So that's not a huge, you know, moment. Don't wait to the end of the project to try it out. But, you know, when you want to take a break from your current project, give it a weekend. Give it a week. Uh, check it out. See how it can help you. You can grab this uh, and learn more uh, of the Sunburn Gaming Engine over at SynapseGaming.com. All right. Um, did we get the audio level thing fixed? Are you guys is sound smile or two hearing that? Okay. I tried to do a quick fix during the ad, and not derail too bad. Before I I just say hey let's start the show I can edit this bit out without much pain. Still a little low. I, I don't know, man. The levels did they go up at least? I'll, I'll jack that meter all the way up. I mean, the meter's pegging in the red on this end now, so uh, I'm going to leave it there. So is this like the Wirecast update? Like, is this an issue with that, basically? <sighs> Are we turned up to 11? Reset all your settings? Well, no, it kept all the settings. Like, it, it kind of, like, I went over them again, but, yeah, I'd had them all, so... Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll leave it there, uh, and, and we'll roll with it, uh, on that. So, all right. All right, everyone. Welcome to the show. Uh, this week, probably gonna spend a little bit of time talking about, uh, the, um, <clears throat> oh, uh, Chrono Trigger. Because I played some Chrono Trigger. I've been playing, uh, Chrono Trigger for about um, a week. I don't think I was playing Chrono Trigger the last time you were over. Did I say that? No. I don't know. I think I think this you is talked about it. Maybe okay. You maybe I just, maybe I just started it. Okay. Uh, at that point. Um. So yes, yeah, so this is part of like when did Chrono Trigger come out? Ninety five, ninety six. I think it was later than that. I think it would have been. I know I played it. So like SNES, 98, SNES is like 95. 97, 98, maybe. So SNES came out like 1995, right? So this is a later game in the SNES history? I can't. I think it was. It was definitely after Final Fantasy 2 and 3. 
Well, okay, because I went in the Air Force in 94. No, since that had to come out in 94, because that Christmas I gave um, my, um, <clears throat> my my brothers the SNES that I bought for Christmas. So like I was in the Air Force, and the guy was like out of money. And... 95. He was 95. The Chrono Trigger came out? Yep. Wow. Chrono Trigger came out in 95. Okay, so it was, it, it, was, it was not behind, far behind the launch of the SNES. Um, so, yeah, so I went in the Air Force. Um... Got a Super Nintendo from from somebody. You know, Super Nintendo may have come out a couple of years before that, then, and we just didn't have one. Um, yeah, it was a while before I got one because Dad was like, "You already you, have a Nintendo. You've got a Nintendo. Why do you need, Why do you need another one? You know." Um, so uh, you don't play the games you've got. Why no, I did more? that, but you know. Yeah. So. Um, Anyway, yeah, so I, in there, like, a guy needed money, military, everybody's broke, and so I ended up getting one for, like, a hundred bucks, and that included, like, a TV. Uh, it had, he had, like, Link to the Past, Mortal Kombat, um, a couple other SNES games. And this was, like, in, around Thanksgiving time, I got it from him, and then I realized, like, I don't have a ton of money, so, like, I gifted the SNES with all the games to my brothers at Christmas. Um... And then, so I didn't have a console, and I didn't play a console. Um, the game that I played was the game, the 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 pussy chasing game. Uh, that was I was new to this game. Um, my previous experience of RPGs the game. had had not prepared me. Like I I I was like, look, I don't understand what what Ultima Underground has taught me is like I just need to dump all the points into Charisma. I'm good, right? You know, <laughs> but. I don't even know how to get experience points to even, like, figure out where I would put points into Charisma. So, um, yeah. So that, that was that was 19-year-old Mike. Far, far cry from, like, the, the 29-year-old Mike. Much different. Um, more experience at the game. But, uh, yeah. So that's what I was doing. Uh, going, getting drunk, uh, binge drinking. Um, a lot of that was happening. And so that's why I never played <laughs> the SNES PlayStation, uh, PlayStation Two even had come out. I think it wasn't until the Xbox launched that I got interested again in gaming. I was interested in PC gaming. I came back to PC gaming um, in the late nineties, so around ninety eight, ninety nine. Um, I started getting back into PC gaming. Not really, maybe ninety seven. Um, so I did get on I, like the tail end of Warcraft. And StarCraft coming out is about when I got back in, and then, you know, PC gaming and all that. Uh, but then the Xbox console coming out, that's when I got back into console gaming. So there's a big gap, and there's a lot of iconic games now that people talk about that came out in that era. I just have not played. Um, <coughs> Chrono Trigger being one of them. And the, uh, the version that I'm playing now is the DS version. I'm also simultaneously watching the Giant Bomb uh, Chrono Trigger playthrough. What version are they using? They are using the SNES version. They actually got their hands on a real SNES card. In fact, they actually had the battery fuck up and lose their saves. After the guy because it was asked, so old. Yeah, because the guy asked them, do you want me to change the battery out before y'all start playing? And they said, no, we'll just fly with it. And then... <sighs> By the way, I went on there because before I do this with Final Fantasy, mm -hmm. I was like, hmm... I wonder if I should go ahead and replace Which Final the Fantasy are you wanting to play? The original? Final Fantasy. Period. The fucking Final Fantasy. The <laughs> okay. final of the okay. fantasies. <laughs> okay. okay, and you are wanting to live stream this. Is well, what you're record planning. and up. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Uh, I already okay. got. I already did a whole bunch of testing to record by Nest. By the way, there's a lot of problems if you're going to record from a Nest. Yes. Uh, but I got some hardware that will do it. Um, and, and, and it'll come out okay. And I was thinking before I do that, maybe I should change the battery in this cart and i went online and that needs a fucking soldering iron so that's probably not gonna happen you know if you have i paid like 35 dollars for that nest cart man i was gonna say if you have a copy of the original final fantasy would not open that thing up yeah or, yeah. or the original chrono trigger even yeah so um <clears throat> doesn't look crazy hard but it does involve taking a soldering iron those things are worth money now. Button. Like those, those like yeah, if it was... shit. I paid thirty-five dollars for a fucking Nintendo. Game. Exactly. Like no. Um... 
but incidentally, it's the Final Fantasy. Because I, I, like I said, I played both the original NES Final Fantasy and the GBA version, and I don't know if there are any other versions floating around out there. There are every other. Oh, it's version, on the iPhone obviously. now. I mean, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like probably on the Ouya. I played. Um, I actually recently started playing through Final Fantasy two, which I've played through most of. But I played through it. I, I played through most of it on the SNES. But I picked up the the uh, GBA version, and it is much different. The newer Final Fantasies, and this is what I'm curious about with Chrono Trigger. Although Chrono Trigger came later than Final Fantasy II, as I remember, so it may be there may be less changes because it was less painful but to start. There out. Are the big changes. thing but... with Chrono Trigger, right, is the active time combat system. Like right. that was new. Also. Chrono Trigger was Square Enix. Yeah. Not like Square Enix, but Square, comma, Enix. Enix. Square and Together. Enix as two separate companies. Um, I mean, that just doesn't happen anymore. Like, two competing studios in a genre. You know, I mean, that would be like Epic getting together with ID Software and making a first-person shooter, you know? And... These, these were designs games for a more civilized time, is what yes. I'm saying. And not only that, they had like Akira Toriyama do the character designs, like the guy who did Dragon Ball Z. So it was yes, you know, yeah, and that's that's kind of evident in Chrono. It like, is that dude has one stick and does it, and that's his thing. Yeah, we we were talking about this last week. I can't remember where I looked it up. I think it, no, I think you IM'd me something about like one of the characters, and I started looking up on some wiki you know, like the wiki site for Chrono Trigger and just seeing the game art, especially like the cutscene art. I was like, man, I don't know if I could play that now. Cause all I would think is Dragon Ball Z do not want. <laughs> You're talking about the new cutscenes? I think. Yes. Created? Yeah. So, okay. So the differences between the NES and the DS version is a retranslation has been done. Right. Um, there's some fan ire behind some of the translation things that I honestly can't give a fuck about because I'm not like a diehard fan, but like, Frog talks normal. Instead he of talks ribbit. more a a proper sentence structure, but he's not thoueth and ieth oh, yeah. and all that. You know, there's not ths on or anything. Now it's cool because I'm watching the guys replay the original SNES version, so I'm kind of I'm able to like see um, and probably more up on the differences than most people who actually played the original when it came out and then played the DS version. Um, because I'm watching them like back to back, and you know, there's spells have been renamed too. The game has been politically corrected too. So like, interesting. Uh, Robo doesn't have an Uzi punch. He has a rapid arm now. Okay. Right? So that's that's not a translation error. Nobody was confused with what Uzi punch it was. You know, it, it now it's it's rapid punch. Um, still looks as cool, but it's the name. Yeah, the graphics are all the same, but some of the, the same. some of the spell names have changed. Some of them well, make a hell of a lot more sense. Like, uh, it's called um, Confuse. Uh huh. Chronos Confuse in the original, but now it's called Confuse. Is kind of if you look at older... combo attack or 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 quad attack or. Quad strike or something like that. Or yeah. something strike. Like, Conf you know, extreme strike or something. It's called something that's like, hey, I'm going to hit this guy four times in a row. Yeah. If you Whereas look confuse is like, the monster's going to be confused after this. And, you know, there is a confused spell in the game. Yes. So so some of the things um, have been translated for the better. Some of the things I've kind of gotten irritated in the translation in the new version. Because they... Beyond Uzi Punch, they really sanitized some storylines. So you may or may not remember um, the little bo boy who finds the hero badge. Ta-ta. Right? Yes. So he finds the hero badge, and everybody's like, oh, he's heroes from our village. And, you know, like the, ma the, the, the maids in the tavern are all like, ah, oh, that scoundrel. You know, I can't believe he's a hero and all that. But he, that's the only one. Everybody else is like, my son is the hero and all that. And then, you know, eventually, by the way, we're going to spoil Chrono Trigger it's been out long enough. Pine. Yeah, Whatever. Like, there's no moratorium. But we're not going to spoil the ending of it because I've actually played the ending of it. I haven't, I, I haven't got to that point yet. Um, <coughs> but uh, so in, in, in the original, when he comes clean, you know, like, I just found this and I went to sell it and they called me the hero and I ran with it, you know. Uh, and then dad's like, you 
screw up son and like you know, I can't, yes. you know, he's, oh, I'll have to, you know, get on him. And grandfather was like, ah, I can't believe he did all this. You know, he, he needs to focus. The boy needs, you know, smoking and all that. Now, the text is like, oh, well, that's my son. You know, he's always energetic and out there. I think he's going to be a pirate one day. Ha, ha, ha. And, and the grandfather is like, oh, my grandson, he's such a huckster. And we all love him. And he's great and wonderful. And I was like, man, you know, like... I worried about like Tata's father hitting the kid in the original one, but now I'm like all pissed off that you would whitewash it that hard, uh, uh, you know, and change it. N nothing ever significant. Uh, some other things are gone too, like the um, Ozzy slash and flea. Yes. And the one guy that's like Ozzy slash and flea or like tone deaf or something. Mm -hmm. Like, there's one guy in a tavern that makes a thing of, like, oh, there's three minions, Ozzy, Slash, and Flea, and, you know... And they're all tone-deaf. And they're all, like, tone-deaf guy, you know, something like that, and which is very obviously not a mistake in translation, right? Because those are American, you know, Ozzy, Slash, and Flea... There's that an, wouldn't have occurred to me. There's, there's a, a side joke in there. There's a I lot of side Ozzie jokes in Chrono Trigger. and Slash when I was growing up, but Flea just threw me completely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, it's actually interesting because isn't there, have you, have you played through the Aussie slash and flea segment yet? Yes. Yeah. I'm all the way up to like, one long. of them is like, is that the character that they can't tell if he's a flea? Okay. Yeah. yeah flea. You can't tell if the, a he's like, I'm a man. guy. He's like, did they keep that really? in? Yes, yeah. they did. Okay. Yeah. They keep the whole, like, I'm a guy, but you know, can I look beautiful too or something? And Yeah. It seems uh, weird that... <clears throat> and there is, like... Okay, fast forward to the timeline. There is some things, like... I do have some problems with some of the plot. Okay. You know, as far as, like... Chrono Trigger does not establish and adhere to a rules of time travel. So if you're going to have time travel as a thing... You need to set up what are the parameters of which time travel is possible. Okay? Can I see myself, for instance? Will that create a paradox? If I do create a paradox, do I destroy the timeline? Or if I create an alternate version of the timeline that then makes it possible to create the alternate version of the timeline because I changed some events that led to it, you know, what happens in all of that? And, you know, so the biggest one that bugs the hell out of me is Luca saving her mother. Right. This really, like, fucking sticks in my crawl, all right? Because... Okay, you go to Luca's house. She goes back in time to when her mother gets crippled, right? And her 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 notebooks say, you know, she gets this little notebook. Like, oh, I'm a girl, and science is dumb, and girls shouldn't do science, right? That's basically yeah. what the book says. Um, and you're like, okay, so she has no interest in science. And you go downstairs, and the mom's getting sucked into the machine, and you gotta enter the code, and the fucking game, I fucking entered the code right the first time. So, like, this was spoiled for me. I already knew about this segment, because somewhere along the lines, I read about some rant of, like, the, the ten worst things about game ports, and it was the fact that you had to enter L-A-R-A -A on a PlayStation with no fucking L-A-R-A -A buttons, yes. right? So, um... And they could have renamed her to, like, Laura or something with O's. And that would have been fine in the Chrono Universe. And you'd be like, oh, there's an O on here. I get it. Left O. All right. O. Right? But no. Um, so I, I read that. Like, I knew that that was coming. All right? Um, way before I even decided to replay this. So I knew that going in, like, what the password was going to be. Uh, and I go, and I enter, and, like, and it's like, ding, ding. It's making little dings as I enter the right key. It's like, ding, ding, ding. ding. No sound. Like, what, what, what the f fuck, do I start over and enter it again? And then like, she's in there, and I'm like, oh, motherfuckers, reset the whole goddamn thing. I gotta do the whole, like, campfire scene all over again, because there's no chance to save from that, right? Yeah. Like, you gotta finish the Bobo fight, have the little campfire thing, and, and, and all that shit. Go through all that again, and I do save her. But while she's going in, first of all, while she's going in, she screams to her daughter to go over to the machine and input the password. So let's break this down for a second. Mom knows there's a machine. She knows the machine can be shut down by entering the password. Doesn't know the fucking password and is yelling at her four-year daughter, four-year-old daughter, to go enter that password there. Like, really, this is kind of mom's fault here. Like, you you should have like go over there and punch in L A R A. 
OSHA doesn't exist in 1000 AD. And, and the other thing is, is by the time like her husband has built something this huge and complex, you should know not to touch this fucking shit. <laughs> you know? At that just... point, it doesn't need to be dusted. I, anyway, it does not anyway, need to be dusted. So, you go in, you enter the password, nobody sees you, okay? You don't get seen or spotted or anything, so there's no paradox from like, hey, I saw myself. Uh, in other things, stop it. And then when you leave, the notebooks now. Okay, so when I failed on my way back out, the notebook was updated to say, I feel so horrible. This is all my fault that I should have understood these machines better. And I'm going to dedicate my life, you know, to science so this doesn't happen again. And that's like, that's the tragedy that is why she goes so deep into science that she can create a fucking time machine. We're not talking about like she does a little cardboard cutout for the, the fair, the science fair of like which laundry detergent works for best. For the science fair, she okay. made a teleportation device that happened to also be a time right. machine. She makes a teleportation device and then understands how time travel works to make a fucking pocket fucking ziggy to like time travel. <laughs> all right? That is dedication. That is extreme dedication to science. And when you save her, the alternate timeline where you save her, you go to the notebook and the notebook says, oh, I should learn about science. So something like that doesn't possibly happen again. Mom almost got hurt. And it's like, that's not what motivates someone enough to create a fucking teleportation machine and master the, the, the intricacies of time travel. Time and space. So, all right. Fine. Whatever. She creates a time travel machine. Everything else happens. But now, this alternate Luca is going through time, has no knowledge that Luca A actually entered the password to stop everything from going wrong. So Luca B will never enter the password. So at that moment, like, Luca A should not exist. But like she Luca whole, should forget that yes. this ever possibly happened. She should not be able to have a conversation with Robo about like, you know, that really bothered you, didn't it? It's great that you fixed it. Nobody knows of that. That event never fucking happened. Here's okay. Here's what happened. Here's what really happened. Luca created a fucking time paradox, ripped the time space continuum, <laughs> and it reacted by creating fucking Lavos. Lavos is Luca's fucking fault for fucking with the timeline. <laughs> that is the truth of Chrono Trigger. And that's why that one portal is red. It's the only red portal. I'm gonna make a point, <laughs> and, and I, this this is this is this is the point that I think you can only make about this game. You can only make about any game after you've played it. It's kind of like we were talking about Diablo too. You play that through enough, you know what everything is. You play Chrono Trigger through on New Game Plus enough, you kind of see that there are very limited options. It's not hard sci-fi. It's not. It's not. Time travel is a device used to further the plot and and kind of make things interesting it is not an exploration of time travel time travel is the it's, it's like in a lot of tv shows like the you know a lot of sci-fi tv shows the main underlying mythos works however it needs to work in the current episode to make interesting thing happen there well, might be some mechanics but I haven't yeah. finished the book yet, but when I finish the monomyth, I think I can pretty much line up Chrono Trigger point for point all the way down, right. like, the segments. Um, I mean, like, you start out just an average day, check, you know? Um, event happens that, like, uh, teases you a, a grand adventure at which you go off on, check. But then you refuse the grand thing like i'm gonna come back home but something happens that prevents you from returning to the life as you know it check you know like all the way down to like resurrection check you know yep. <laughs> oh jesus you don't have chrono. to jesus chrono <laughs> like he's coming down oh, there's a fucking tree i don't know what the tree has to do but there's always a fucking tree and like a tree or a bush or something in the biblical stuff so like that's in there you know, i didn't think about that but it is kind of weird that you chrono did just well, he's Jesus fucking Chrono. Okay, you don't actually have to save Chrono, but 
that happens towards the end. A lot of those choices happen towards the end of the game where it doesn't you really Proto? matter. Usually Chrono's your most beefed up guy because he's well, in there forcibly until that point. If you play the game enough, if you level up enough with New Game Plus, it doesn't I really matter. I save Chrono every fucking time. I think I, I think I went through and got as many. I don't know if I got every ending, but I got as many as I could possibly get. I probably did at some point get every ending. So there's an ending where you just like, yeah, fuck it, he's dead. Yeah, I do think so. Like, there I, is. I had a guide that would show you all the different endings, so I can't remember how. you And by got endings, them. you just mean cutscenes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's what it's. It's not like there's major plot variations and, and but, things like this. It's like when you defeat Lavos, you'll get some like epilogue, and that's what you're changing. Depending, it, kind of like Dragon Age. Like you'll just kind of get like it's different every time, and there are some that are neater than others. But in general, yeah, and it's. I mean, like I was saying, it's really a it's a Final Fantasy game. It's it's a, a JRPG. It's not a an experiment in like writing about time travel. Time travel is like the no thing. no. I'm not saying that at all. Like no, the whole, I the whole thing. I mean, it just I'm just plot holes. I mean, it's just I understand. And and like I said, after if you play it through enough, you. It does feel a little more hollow than a lot of other JRPGs. I love JRPGs. the game, and it, it doesn't have plot potholes. It has plot pitfalls. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, mechanically, like, so the act of time combat, because, you know, a lot of this is if we're going to make a JRPG, like, I need to, to, to kind of understand, I need to play the other one so I kind of understand, you know, what's out there, and what, do, what do I like and what do I not. Um... The active time combat thing is interesting. I don't know that, to me, I give it as high a place on, like, the JRPG pantheon as, like, it seems to be get, you know? Yeah. Because, to me, it... it, it when you say active it's time, a, you mean that enemies can go as you're entering commands and, and things right, like Right, right. Like, you're, okay. you're against the clock to enter your commands yeah. and all that. But because you're so against the clock... So, like, okay, as, as an evolution over the, the the strict menu, now it's your turn, now make a move, now it's his turn, make a move, um, you know, Dragon Warrior uh, type, and I'm assuming Final Fantasy. I, I haven't played. Generally, yeah, if yeah. you're if you're gonna play the original Final Fantasy, you will see the extreme opposite. You will see what things used to be with that active right. time. Right. So system. as a as a like, okay, this is an evolutionary step. I get it. Um, as something you want to emulate, I don't. I don't think so because the problem that I experience in playing with it is uh, in Chrono Trigger, the bosses are really like mini puzzles. Like, okay, I've got a new boss. I got to figure out what's his stick. What's he gonna do? What do I gotta be prepared to counteract? And what's going to be the combination among my party that I'm going to use to be able to take him down? Because there's almost so far, and I'm I'm pretty near the end of the game. Like I've done almost all the ending side quests now. Um, so far, there has been like once you understand how this boss behaves, he's not gonna be a challenge. Right. But it's a matter of finding that, um, and. As the game goes on later, the game actually punishes you for blindly attacking. So yes. later games, if you have like multiple bosses or multiple attack points on screen, and you use an area all effect, uh, attack, um, that's not going to work on that. <laughs> and that's you're that's... fucking dead, man. Because like it's going to get like three counter attacks off, and then they're going to like beat the shit out of you um, for for hitting all at once. And so you kind of have to go in. And, and experiment. And so, while you're trying to experiment, the problem is you're against his clock. And I'm down at, like, trying to find the damn spells. Because even on the DS version, which appears to be better than the, the NES version, because uh, it's using the dual screens. It's but quicker. Yes, it's clearer to find the spells. But this may actually compound my, my complaint a little more. Uh, but then again, having that one little line or two, two or three little lines to find all your shit would piss me off as well. While you're so dairied in that menu... It's easy to miss the damage numbers popping up above everybody's head, because I'll cast something like, okay, let's just go in with a physical attack with Chrono, and then let's get a heal queued up on, on Meryl, so that I'm ready for whatever he's doing. Oh shit, I just missed Chrono's physical attack, 
What did it do? Did that do zero? Did that do decent? Did that do nothing? You know, I fuck now I don't know. Yeah, you do have the option to turn on turn off active time. You can go with wait. Well, that's like when you launch the game. Yes. Okay. That's a game launching decision. That's not a that's like, hey, can't change this once you go. I, I would argue that the, the counter to active time, what I, I think given what you've said, what's really missing, is a system like in Dragon Age or like in Final Fantasy twelve where your party also basically has active time, so the battle will go on and while they, you're making your right. decisions. Right, so in Dragon Age, they think for themselves. Right. Under You can you can code them with a script or something. They can kind of think for themselves. And then you can take control of them. And then at any moment, to. you can take direct control of a different player, um, You know, leave your character, control one of your party members for a while, um, have them do something special, pull in, pull back, that kind of thing. Uh, but then basically, yeah, you can have these pre-programmed scripts that they run on, which is which is great. Which is uh, I love the Dragon Age, uh, the original Dragon Age, um, or Origins system. I mean, I, yeah. I fuck, that game's great. That game's awesome in several ways. Um, so I I do get that, but I think I you know I don't know. Like when we sit down to actually do what I'm saying, like, hey, we're going to do this JRPG, like, it, there may not be much jrpg left to it, you know? I think it's a good exercise to start from, but then we're kind of, like, I'm, I'm piecing in, like, okay, well, I want that, but not this, but that, this, not, you know, and where it may end up may not look um, even like a tactics, you know, right. style game. Um, I, I'm going to argue, though, that tactics is fundamentally a different, type of game like right, that right. Time, that's, at that point that's, you the leave. jrpgs kind of some of them integrate it now i mean some of them are yeah the but, combat is tactics um yeah once once you get off into a separate battle map and stuff like that it seems like you were playing fights you were playing longer. jrpg not so long ago that got into a battle map what was that one that wasn't blue dragon no um eternal we, sonata possibly no i i perfected that one almost the mic, please I perfected Eternal Sonata almost as soon as it came out, so it wasn't Eternal Sonata. I haven't played that game in so while. Okay. <laughs> well, I know that it had, like, your location mattered, but it wasn't, like, Final Fantasy tactics She played something, style. and when she when it broke into combat, went onto a grid. Um, mm. And then, like, would line up the character, and then they would hit two behind it, you know, with that attack or something. Um, which actually Chrono Trigger slightly hints at. Like, it does have horizontal attacks and, and, and area Slash attacks. Because Slash one... Where he does the almost lightning slash attack, where he does a shockwave across the ground. Wind slash. Yeah. Shockwave because he's lightning. <laughs> it doesn't do lightning damage. It does. It does the wind damage or whatever. It's not lightning damage. Well, I think the the difference in Chrono Trigger has those tactical elements, but it's not so fiddly where you have to like concentrate on them. You can just no, kind of let but it. But that active timing again gets in the way because like. Oh, they're all three in the area. Hit the button. This guy moved out. Now you like, yes. You know. Wait for cyclone. Wait for cyclone. I, wait for cyclone. Too late. <laughs> I really think if you know when we're making those decisions, we may actually want to have that as an option. You can turn off and on at will because then it becomes two different games. Like you satisfy the person who wants to get in there and fiddle with options, and you also satisfy the person who plays RPGs for reasons other than the combat. Um, now, I think one thing that works in Chrono Trigger, um, it works for Chrono Trigger, is the idea of the silent protagonist. Like, Chrono doesn't speak. Right. Chrono Ever. never enters dialogue, Chrono never says anything, and I think it's left for you, then, to project upon him what his response was. You I know? made him a badass in my head. <laughs> like, you know, if he gave lip back to the king, then that happened in your head. But you don't have to watch him, like, kiss ass to the king when you're like, no, fuck the king, you know? Yeah. Um, whereas all the girlfriend. other characters, you know, they're going to say their bits and they're going to and they're gonna do their thing. You know, like when, when Magus is there, Frog's going to say his shit, you know? He's not going to back down because he's a character with a background and you get that. But Chrono's background is never defined for you. Like, you don't know who Chrono is. It's just the character you're playing. You didn't pick stats on him, and you didn't pick and customize attributes like you would in a later game, probably. But um, you still, it's still your character. It's still your Chrono because they have a silent protagonist. I don't know that I want to do a silent protagonist. 
um, simply Those because like the story that's woven out. Um, I have a specific arc for the hero to go through, and yeah. you know relationships and reactions and things like that. Um, well, I think Chrono Trigger also works because it's a little more whimsical. Like going back and playing through. Um, the, the first Final Fantasy is a good example because that is, you create a party of adventurers, it's basically, th there's basically no dialogue, but there is a story. Um, th there's no dialogue from your party. Uh, playing Final Fantasy 2, you, you are the main character. Like, Cecil is, like, kind of your avatar because... The game always follows him, even as other characters leave and come back to the party. And believe me, it happens a lot more than I remember it. <laughs> Maybe I'm just playing through faster because it's easier on the GBA. Um, but he definitely has his own story arc, and you're just kind of following it along. So, I th But it's not as whimsical. Neither of those are as whimsical as Chrono Trigger. And kind of like joking around in, in, in the main thread of the story. Chrono Trigger does a great job, um, and this, man, is so fucking painful to watch the, the video, because, watch the Giant Bomb guys play through the video, because they're fucking idiots. I mean, they truly are. Like, you, you need to watch the playthrough, and let me know what, what point you quit watching them play through, because it just it was probably too... won't take long. Again, you play through that enough? That was my 11th grade education, Chrono Trigger. <laughs> I was on homebound that year. But but I mean you you watch them play through it and and knowing what's around the corner but knowing like the obvious thing that they just missed. You know like there's a scene where they're in the palace underground, the the under ocean palace, right? And you run into those red, blue and green um creatures which Chrono Trigger is fucking slowly hitting you over the head with so it, it it's actually really creative it's actually i mean really good the way that chrono trigger introduces um these these elementals okay because when you first walk in the zone with the elementals the first group that you're going to encounter react to lightning which is chrono and at this point in the game you have your lightning 2 spell probably so you're you're probably just like spamming the hell out of lightning 2 because you got it not that long ago, and it fucking is just awesome, and you just go into it, it's like, oh, I got four monsters, fuck you, lightning too, you know, this, fuck you, lightning too. And you have this great moment that I've talked about in a lot of my talks of empowerment, right? So, you fall a lot of things, you level up, you get the level, and then there's a moment where the game just lets you beat the shit out of it. Because it's like, enjoy your newfound power. So you're going in, you're spamming lightning too, and you spam lightning too on these first yellow ones, and then, you know, they work. And the next ones you're probably going to run to are probably going to be the red. Now, you could go way around and hit the blue, but you're going to hit the yellow first, and more importantly, but then you're going to hit the red or the blue, which, of course, react to water or fire. But these heal. These monsters heal if you use any element that's not yes. their element. They don't appear with any other monsters, and they always appear in sets of three, so it's always kind of a big deal. But because they're in sets of three, you're going to use your area attacks. Right? Now, um, it's depends on how you play it. If you're playing like I did, uh, which is my my main crew is 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 Chrono, uh, Luca and Marl. Um, Meryl. If you play with those three, you have lightning, ice and fire. Right? So you're just perfectly matched for that. Yeah. Frog is water. Um, I think if you're paying attention, you would never put Meryl and Frog in a party because you would realize you just doubled up on your water. Um, and, you know, you kind of want to be flexible. And it gets a little weird when you start including, like, Isla or Robo that don't really have an element. They have shadow. Um, okay. yeah, Robo is shadow. Uh, but, um, who's the other one you said? Isla. Isla. Who's Isla? The, Vegas? No. The, the cave Prehistoric woman. lady. Oh, oh, okay, Beat the yeah, shit out yeah, of you yeah, with yeah. She's my fist. She's just, like, fist. physical. I don't think she <laughs> has one. No, she's yeah. physical. She has, uh, she has she dark magic. She before magic. That's she has well. She had. She existed when magic was created by Lavos. Um. So anyway, uh, you go into the next room and like you spam your lightning, and uh, they all get healed. You're like, holy shit, that did not work. Uh, and you know, experiment around, and then you know, you'll you'll get fire, right? And the beauty is that when you spam the lightning on them, they say 
Something to the effect of counter all magic, not fire. What does that tell you? Not fire? Perhaps I should use fire. fire. Right? So they kind of get you trained into, okay, now the game is going to make a big deal from this point forward on the different powers of attack. Like, up until that moment, the dragons, you know, they were like, oh, not the dragons, the uh, dinosaurs. They're like, hey, you can stun them with lightning. Like, try lightning on the dragons. Uh, that's a, uh, on the, on the um, dinos. Dinos. They'll react well to that, you know. So you, you kind of played with that, but you hadn't, like, really run into, like, I'm going to have to be prepared, be diverse. And you go through the level, and you kind of clear out the level, and you find everything, and then you go down the elevator, and, like, the game is like, fucking pop quiz, bitches. You're going to get, like, three battles in a row, and we're going to throw at, oh, here's some yellow ones. Here's some red ones. Here's one of each, a red, a yellow, and a blue. Like, if you haven't fucking got it now, we're explicitly pointing this shit out to you, right? Yeah. And they're called Scout, and, Red Scout, and Blue Scout. And, and you know, so, so the game is a very good job of teaching you that it's changing the rules and in what way are the rules changing. But as I remember, I, I do remember Elemental being a factor, although, again, in later Final Fantasy games, that's something you, you start to learn and they start to play with it more, like, as you said. It is kind people. of an RPG trope. Like, anybody going yeah. into an RPG, as soon as I saw there were Elemental Magic, I knew that but it, um, like the other thing that is teaching you uh, in its world, the other thing that you should grab from it is if like that creature is using fire, then you, I should use the opposite. You, no, you use the same, because like those those the fire the red bats are you you take down with okay. fire. Um, I'm thinking of later. It does switch. There is a okay. point later where you run into some that um, you you. Don't want to use fire on the sun, for example. The, the interesting thing about Chrono Trigger, I remember, is it doesn't beat you over the head with that. Like, it, it will help you, but you can still, in some places, use physical. And I remember Chrono Cross, which was... The much-awaited supposed sequel. It's not really a sequel. Supposed sequel. But I remember every character had an element, and it was shown right there on the combat screen, and it was just... I remember time. it being super painful because you had to be very, very careful of what you used. And it it was almost like it took that system and decided, I'm going to be clever, and just became yeah. painful because the, it locked you in. The game, I think it does good other things to vary up the combat. Uh, and even though, I, you know, like I said at the beginning, like the active time system, it, it had my eyes diverted from the important information too much, right? Uh, because it was like, Okay, I fuck, I need to revive this person. So like Chrono's set to, you know, like doing cyclones or something, but now I, where the fuck's the revive in the list again? Here yeah. it is. Um the DS has the option of using the stylus to to pick spells, but you just can't simply do that fast enough. Like that 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 is too slow of an interface. You need to be on the buttons. Um because a lot of that like it does remember like the original one was like what was the last thing you cast. So you can just like, oh, they're up, spam A, bam, 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 you know, do your thing again, you know, uh, they all target the same one, and that kind of works the same way. Um, but, you know, it does also teach you that in different places where it varies up, like there is, um, is it Magus? No, it's not Magus, it's a big robotic looking dude. Robo? No. Uh, oh, you're talking about like enemies. He's got two fists. Oh, the big bat thing. And he's on the... top of the mountain of Guru. Mountain of Woe. Is that where he's at? Mountain of Woe, where you're rescuing Melcher. Yeah. Yeah. He's the one you fight to break the chain and crash the the one world in, into the water. Um, when you go into him, he's kind of the first battle where you realize it's not good to wipe out all yeah. of the sub. Because if you wipe out both of his fists, you guarantee they're going to respawn. If you wipe out one of the fists, it'll be a while before he'll respawn the other. And then you can kind of tease apart, well, this one's doing damage, this one's doing healing. Do I want to lock out the one that heals him or the one that hurts me? You know, which, depending on your party, it, it may vary uh, to that. But he also teaches you to hold off a bit. Like, even though you get this active time, just because somebody's done doesn't mean you should use them. Because you can do that battle much more effectively if you kind of wait and counter 
to whatever he did, because if he does a light attack, you're, you're cool. But if he spawned his fist and does his three-way attack, you're going to fucking need to heal. And you're going to be back onto a different side cycle. So it pays to wait. And um, the game does a good job, I think. I think. You, the guys that do the Giant Bomb playthrough, they don't fucking ever really <laughs> tease this stuff out. But I think the game does kind of tease out, like, hey, there's going to be a system here. Now, sometimes... It's not always the same system battle to battle. No. But it is almost never the same system battle to battle from boss to boss. Usually they warn you there's a lot of text. There's a lot of flavor text that... that... Sometimes. But sometimes you can walk in a battle and they just don't fucking tell you shit. Um, the, the, the thing with Cyrus... Well, this was actually a quest. But the thing with Cyrus is Ghost. It doesn't fucking tell you shit of like... What you're going to have to do for the side quest. Like, I was all of that thing, exploring all over. People talking about the instability of the underground cavern. So, I'm looking at a way to, like, cause it to collapse or something. So that maybe I can get elsewhere or, you know, something like that. And it's not because I wasn't there for, like, the seventh time. All of a sudden, somebody in the town. I'm just like, I'm just fucking talk to everybody again. I'll have Frog be the lead this time. See if anybody says something different, you know? Any fucking thing to do with this, and I hate this fucking thing, and I'm going to leave it again in a second and come back to it. Um, And um, that's when somebody goes, here, have my carpenter tools. It's the mayor's wife. And then in the time period, she's like, my husband left his tools again. Somebody wanted the pedophile guy, wanted the carpenter tools. I call him a pedophile guy because he had like all those young boys up in his attic and they're all just like, yes, some Boss is at the tavern. Boss yeah. is at the tavern. They all say the same. Like, that was just creepy. You got a whole bunch of kids up in your attic, young boys. You're off drinking. I don't want to know what's going on here. Good state. But I think this is the Middle Ages so we can burn you at the stake. I think that's what we do. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, you know, eventually I got that kind of unwound, but nobody, at any point, like, nobody in the party, nobody in town, nobody went, like, maybe we should try to repair this place, you know? Um, or if we repair this, we get this up. Like, you know, Frog will say, like, well, the whole point was Cyrus, and the thing will go Glenn, and then it'll just go back to, like, so, I mean, that even, like, sends you in the wrong direction, because you think, like, Okay, I just got to do the right thing, and he's going to trigger this memory, and that's going to tell me what the next piece is. And then you get the Sunstone. Okay? Moonstone. You flip over a different conquest, you go in there, and I just stumbled in this room, so I don't know if something guides you to this room, but I was kind of like checking things. I had Nintendo Power, so oh, okay. I, I don't... So I did the, I did the origin of the robots, uh, which they do tell you where to go. I don't know if they did this in the original one. They in the did. original one... They just said the words in the original one. In the original one, do they let you know that you can talk to your party members and that your party members will give you clues as to the different side quests where they start? I cannot remember. So the text of the original one um, does not seem to... Watching the, the, the Giant Bomb guys play through it. The guy in the center never says, like, hey, talk to your party members because they may be attached to some of these events. The only thing he says is, like, somebody near you is in trouble and go help them. Um, but he didn't tell you that you should talk to the party members when they're not in your party, and they'll have dialogue. So okay, now now I know what you're talking about. Right. Like when they're not in your party. When they're not in your party. So um, I don't blame the giant bomb guys, but you can totally talk to them, and they will tell you like, hey, you know, I think the origin of robots is about me. You know, and and there's this factory called Genodome. Maybe we should look there. Um, so that's why I had gone there, you know, talked to Robo, and then I was just flying around the future and, and found this, like, I don't think I've landed, go in this cave, this looks weird, hey, look, there's a power tab, oh, Jesus Christ, that's not a power tab, it was a fucking boss battle, and that was the one time I was like, I'm not ready for this shit, I haven't saved, I didn't know I was walking into this, Hooray. run, no, you can't run from this, fuck you, I've never tried to run away in the game at all, <laughs> give me this one run, you know, um, so, uh, yeah, and that, that battle was not prepared for it at all. It took me forever, actually. I think I did that battle for 30 minutes before I got randomly started hitting the flame that damages things. You know, there's like five of those flames around the circle, and you got to hit the right one. And then he spins them, so he mixes them up again. He says, rule it, and it spins around. Um, but you can't, like, hit them all, so I cut out my all attacks, you know, so I didn't get the counters, and then I would just start attacking one, and I would do, like, no damage on it, or very little damage on it. 
Uh, and I was just like, maybe I just gotta do a little damage on it. Because as long as I do one flame, he only does a little damage to me. And I am such a fucking hardcore max min guy. Like, I boosted up my guys. Kept the same party always. So they were all tech max. So, um, like when Lavos killed me, like, I stood a couple rounds with Lavos. And I even said to Sicily, like, I have broken the game a little bit. I was supposed to die in that first blast, wasn't I? I wasn't supposed to be able to, like, resurrect party members and, you know, give it a go. Like, you know, the game was like... Was Eventually, was... Lavos said, you know what? Fuck you! <laughs> and destroyed him. Yeah, like, you know what? All right. <laughs> Fuck you, 2,000 to everyone. <laughs> Fuck you, you know? Um, so, um, so I could last very long. I basically last 30 minutes before I finally started hitting... Uh, one and noticing it damaged the center when I hit that one to realize okay I just got to find that one again and hit that so it wasn't much clue into that boss battle um, but there might have been had I run around and talked to more people because a lot of times somebody has dialogue that will give you a hint um, so that's not what I'm preparing but then I pick up the moonstone all right so he drops the moonstone and Luca goes hey that looks like an old sunstone that's out of energy we should put it somewhere. It's a shame, you know, it would take eons to charge. We should put it somewhere, though, where we would get sunlight. I'm like, well, I've been flying past the sun temple, you know, and it takes eons to charge, so let's go back to 6,000 BC. 6 million BC, drop the sunstone in, and then Luca's like, hey, we should time travel now to the future and get it when it's charged. You know, and it's like 100% spelling on. It almost feels like some quests were, I don't know which one did which, some quests were square and they're dicks, and some quests were Enix and they were nice, you know? <laughs> or vice versa. Yeah, or vice versa. Like, I don't know who is which, but one was like, fuck you, there will be no clues whatsoever, they will get this by exploring and tapping this bush for the seventh time in a row, <laughs> and then it will move, and then they will know to begin doing this thing. And then the other one was like, no, we need to like let the party members suggest and hints of where they need to go. Do you get the moonstone? Where, where do you say you get the moonstone from? Cyrus? No, no, no. Quest? You defeat the sun thing. The thing with the five. Okay, yeah. Spiral. Now I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And then, so um, you charge it up. Now, now that's actually where I'm at. So, like, okay, fuck, fly the future. Oh, fuck. Hey, look, it's gone. All right, go back. Oh, it's not here either. Okay, go back again. Oh, it's not here either. Go back again. Oh, it's not charged up enough. Okay, go forward. And then Luca's like, we're going to have to find it. Who stole it in this time period? Like, how do you fucking know this, bitch? Because if... Because you created the time lift that created fucking Lavos. That's why. <laughs> Actually, Lavos... You're evil. You are Lavos. Lavos <laughs> fell from space. We saw that, but he fell from space in response to her time rift. That that but, was all done on a soundstage. That happened in the past, before Luca started changing things. How did you know that? She's got that... a time machine. <sighs> Besides... She could have gone back, set up that... And then, like, gone forward, got you, and then brought you back to look at the event that she just set up. I expect that Lavos is something like a tick that the Time Lords accidentally released, and it can smell rifts in time. <laughs> Isn't there? Now, I will point out that if you remember, you said Luca f figures out time travel. It has nothing to do with, like, she didn't mean to create it. It happened because, like, some magic. Yeah, but she made a key. She with made a key with Mr. science. Oh yeah, it's but, a wrench. But she figured <laughs> it out because of some magical MacGuffin. It's not about science. Time travel is the <laughs> science, science, you know, science, like, science. Teleportation? Science. That's science in the Chrono Trigger world. Time travel? No, that can only be. Uh, um, Occur, magic occur through magical artifacts. She tames magic with science. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so there's that difference in in the thing. The, the game drags on at the end, though. Like, once you have we done with the chrono and, and... and you're done with the resurrection, and then, like, the whole dude's like, you can go here, you can go here, you can go to the end, you can go fight Labos if you want, you can go do all these things. You're playing also, all the side quests. I don't yeah, know yeah. when this started, when this fucking trope started in JRPGs, or in RPGs. This is not JRPGs, this is fucking RPGs. Okay. All of them. Star slash RPG, right? Um, hey, fucking the world's fucking, fucking, save the world, fucking, fuck, you know, hey, hold on a second, man. The fucking world... Like, you can go save that right now, but, like, dude's cat's up a tree. 
Hey, if you want to go get dude's cat up a tree, you should probably go do that right. Yeah, fuck, the world will be savable in a few moments. You could save the world anytime you want. Why don't you go do all these little piddly ass quests? Well, know? I think. And it's like, up until that, it's like, no, dude, like the fucking time. Like, we have to do this now. We have to save this for all the shit rips apart. And Well, I figure at Chrono Triggers, like, we're traveling through time. I suppose we can travel you through a little bit more time to, to keep things from fucking up. I mean, all the way up to, like, <laughs> Mass Effect. Mass Effect's like, Hey, you fucking fly here, and that's it, man. We're committed. If you fly here, that's a point of no return. I'm just saying, are you sure? Extra dialogue box, cancel or allow. Well, I think I think the reason why this happens in a lot of cases is that these games are designed to end, to end totally after the main quest finishes. Skyrim and Oblivion are good examples of games that don't do that, but they're also games where the main quest is just one of a whole bunch of different, like, it's obviously more serious than all the other issues going on, but it's still the main quest. You know, like, it's still just another quest. Um, so I think that's why they do that. And, and, I think the the way to get around that is to perhaps not make the main quest so grandiose compared to the other quests. Yeah, it's a time like, pressure. Bring they it put down. On you. Like they create the sense of urgency in you, and then have to basically like, oh, we're fucking just shitting with you. Like that's it's yeah. it's okay. It's, but you it's almost fine. have to like you almost it'll, have it'll hold to for a minute. Build something. That that sets up and says like, okay, you finished, you've saved the world, you've you've gotten rid of the major threat, but there's still loose ends you need to tie up. I would rather Ludacris come down from on high and say, "Yeah, dog, you thought I meant now." <laughs> well, I think the other thing, in just in strictly in terms of game mechanics, if you have if you have the main quest line forcing you along, I mean that. Those are the points I hate when, like, I know if I do this next thing, I'm committed. I am committed to following this through until this is done, and this is going to be a long sequence. It doesn't make sense story-wise, but it's it's kind of a pain point. It's, right. it's a point of friction for the, the player. And, you know, I think, I think what Chrono Trigger should have done is all of these side quests, they could have just toned down the bosses a little bit and spread them out throughout your normal, right. like, progression that you would have gone. Because really... Tone down the side quests. Up until that point, spread it's out pretty the linear. Quests. It's a pretty linear experience. Like, there's not much branching option um, until Chrono dies. Like, and Chrono dies is really the first point where you can begin doing these side quests and yeah. running around. Like, even before I went to go save Chrono, I kind of jettisoned around a little bit and, and, you know, experimented around, like, before I go up here and, and do this thing... Um, like, oh, look, there's this thing in the desert here. What, What is this sinkhole? You know, I went in there and got my ass fucking kicked. Because um, that was one of the bosses. I think they were expecting you to play that a little later. But that was one of the bosses of, like, we're going to teach you. And again, Clone Trigger does this beautiful job of setting you up for things that, like, okay, we're going to teach you a concept because it's going to come later. And, like, that skeleton was teaching you that, hey, if you knock out this core... This thing goes batshit insane and will tear your ass a new one. But as long as it has this core, it it will be in a much more low-key fight. Kill everything else. Kill everything else the and core. then take out yeah. this core. Because then later, the same thing happens uh, when you fight the Mother Brain, which... Good God, how they not get sued on that. But they, yeah, you fight the Mother Brain, and, you know, she has these three screens up that heal her. And, you know, it's like drawing that. And if you knock out the third screen, you know, it says you know, like, operating blind, you know, whatever, and then, like, she starts going crazy, and you're like, okay, don't fucking destroy all three screens. Leave her one to heal, but as long as she's got one screen up, we're fine. Uh, also, at that point of the game, they don't do a good job with money. Like, like, making money meaningful. I had so much fucking money by the end of the game. Like, when I got to the point where for 50 Gs, you could get um, the, the, the high-end hats that prevent all status ailments... Yeah, I'm like, hats for everyone. Everybody bam, bam, bam. in my party. You know? yeah, the way I don't um, have to change it. I want to say you get to the point where you can basically heal up and rest for free. 
once you get to the end of the time, end of time, isn't there like a bucket or something that you can? Oh yeah, yeah, you hit that very yeah. early. Like once you can travel to the end of time, there's always that that option. So there's not really any. But like I'm at the level where it's like, yeah, there's fifty fucking shelters. I don't care. Fucking... <laughs> <laughs> I fought two creatures. Fucking shelter. Now, now you're gonna go back <laughs> and you're gonna play the original Final Fantasy, and you're gonna wish for that. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna understand where I understand in yeah. the pantheon that I'm going back in, but I almost think I kind of need to go backwards because, like, I tried to jump back into Dragon Warrior and fuck that. Yeah. So I'm gonna probably have to like de-evolve back into. Uh, That's why I say games. play the play like the GBA or DS versions of Final Fantasy, the re-releases. No, I'm but going. You, I could spend thirty five dollars on that cart, man. He's okay, going yeah, to that play is that. true. Um, but you're you're gonna hate it. So yeah, so they, like they do, you do a good job in They also, I think, Chrono Trigger. There's a lot to learn from the dungeon design uh, in Chrono yes. Trigger of like small concepts introduced early, and then they build upon. They build upon like, hey, here's an escalator. You know, here's an, here's an elevator belt. Can't do anything with it, but go in that direction. You get on it, you go here. You can't go back because when you enter. The one of the early domes, there's two elevator belts, one going up, one going down. And so you can just like make this little circle. There's no point to having them other than to tell the player these are elevator belts and what they do. Uh, and then later you start getting on these elevator belts and now there's creatures on them. And, you know, it's like, hey, you move, but you can run against them to try not to hit creatures. And, you know, later you get elevator belts you can switch directions with uh, and, and deal with that. So... Um, it does a really good job, not only within the same dungeon, but across dungeons. And then even bringing back dungeons and fucking with you a little bit. You know? Of like, when when you replay the uh, lizard level, okay? Um, I forget what you're getting on that quest. I can't remember. You, you're you like, hey, this must have been sent under sea when, when Lavos arrived, right? And it's the lizard. I mean, so at one point you're like, oh yeah, here's the prison where I rescued the... The cave people and, and yeah. all that, and like I'm coming across it again, and it's like, oh man, these fucking buttons. I don't fucking like these fucking buttons, you know. Like last time I pressed buttons, buttons do button, things bad. Know? But it's like the button meanings have switched now, and like you know, like now you want to click these buttons or do things like that, and but it's just a subtle way the game is like taking you to a familiar area, familiar area, but we've we've changed it on you just to kind of fuck with you a little bit, and so you don't know if you're being fucked with or if it's going to do the same thing it always did. Um... I think I think that's very cool. Keep it interesting. Um, I think it should have made it easier for you to avoid um, fights. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of areas that you have to retra- retrace um, to do some of these side quests, and so like you're ridiculously overpowered for um, the the zone that you're going through. And yet, it still has some forced combat sequences, and it's, it's just a waste of time, basically. It's like that forced combat sequence is, is an okay combat sequence, um, but like after a point, it should stop triggering. Yeah, it's better, I suppose, than having um, random combat. Although it does make you feel like you're being led around down yeah, a particular random path. combat. To me, punishes exploration because it makes me feel like every step could be. It does, but it, th- there's kind of a, a balance, and you, you have to make a choice there. Random combat, it punishes exploration, but it makes you feel like you're accomplished for exploring. Having preset, and in and, and Chrono Trigger, a lot of times they're very much preset if you go to a yeah. particular location. It makes you feel like, well, the game kind of expected me to go down this path, and, and you know, it was kind of all planned out. The other thing... Um... Chrono Trigger kind of teaches is, you know, uh, well, Chancellors, fucking kill them. Don't even fucking ask questions, just fucking, Chancellor, just fucking kill it. The moment what the hell is you that? start... Chancellor, fucking dead. I don't oh, know what you do it. Oh, well, you know, sometimes you're wrong, but trust me on this one, <laughs> most of the time. Oh. Also, Chancellors fit in chess quite well. They what? They fit, fit inside in of a chest oh, yes. quite well, you know. Uh, and don't die, apparently. Like, you could lock a Chancellor up in a chest for fucking eons, uh, years and shit, and that's fine. Um, I would have loved to, if somebody would have coded one of the guards in the castle, uh, especially the, the Middle Age castle. Um, or maybe the later one. Like, because you have the trial of Chrono, and you have the trial of the king, and you've got, 
your daughter, and then, like, she's, like, you know, yelling at the cards, get out of the way, you know, all that shit. They're all constantly in between, like, all this shit, and, you know, um, the Chancellor turns on the guard, and all that shit. Like, I just would have loved, like, one of the guys that's standing, like, guard in front of, like, the royal room or something, just to go, like, talk to him. He's like, man, I am not paid enough for this shit. <laughs> you know? Just, like, because it does, in a couple of places, like, break that fourth wall, and, you know, and, and have some good jokes. It just, like, yes. Yes, dude, you are right. The shit you are you not paid enough at this cancel. This. No, no amount of, of pay is worth the shit that uh, goes you are on. You're currently experiencing, um, <laughs> and just you know, raw incompetence by the royal families. You know, of like, wow, you seem totally weird and possessed and like an evil person, for not like the person we used to know at all. Whatever, you're the fucking chancellor. I'll do exactly what you say, even though my daughter is telling me this didn't happen at all. Fucking kill a boy, you know? Like, that's that's what you're doing, you know? Um, yeah, so... Oh, I mean... I see why it's so revered. And especially, like, yeah. you gotta take it in context of when it came out, what was shattering about that, what was new about that. Uh, I mean, basically, you have fucking Square and Enix coming together before they became one company and merged. You know, like, two, two companies that were the top of their fucking game, you know? Um, coming together and then, like you said, bringing in other um, top talent, you know, it's like, hey, we're just gonna, like, you know, come together, make a dream team, and it fucking worked, you know, like, they came up with new concepts that were, moved the genre forward uh, and all that, so um, I haven't finished it. I do kind of like the, the cutscenes. I wish they would have put more in the DS version, because there's a lot of sequences where, like, there's no cutscene. It's like, Frog just, like, Set Cyrus free. There should be a cutscene. There should be a fucking cutscene for this, you know? Um, I know somebody drew something that, for that somewhere. But, uh, no, they actually... I looked at the extras list, and I can replay all the cutscenes that I've unlocked so far. There's only, like, a total of ten to the entire game. I know what they yeah. included, but I know somewhere, somewhere, some fanfic drew that. Um, there's... There is some weird parts about the cutscene, because there's no dialogue in the cutscenes. Uh, so that's kind of weird because they don't actually say anything. Uh, also, the cutscenes do not, I mean, they can't really, the way they did them, include your party. So, right. like, there's this big sequence of getting the e the epoch, you know, with the wings and everything. Uh, and there's a cutscene for that. And it's weird because, like, it's just Chrono walking up to it, checking it out, jumping in the cockpit, flipping the switches and taking off. And you're like, what a dick, dude. You just left the others back there, man. But it, it happens at a time where you can choose your party, so... Yeah, but well, I mean, I mean, you can always have, have been there. You can always choose a party member. There's, There's a few cases where you have to have a certain party member. Yeah. But you, the other one is always up for grabs, so, you know, they can't really... They, they, they It's almost like then you shouldn't have done that as a cutscene. So you do a cutscene where you find Bobo... Because at that point, or Robo, because you find him at that point uh, with Luca and with Meryl, right? That's the only option that you have at that point. They do a, a cutscene of finding him. There's a cutscene for Frog. And there's a cutscene for um, Aya. I'm trying to think, is there anybody that you come across and you can add to your party that they don't get a cutscene? But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think there was a cutscene for... I killed Magus. No, I don't think it was. A, there was a cutscene for the Magus fight. I don't think there was a cutscene for killing him. Because they, they don't seem to have done cutscenes for alternate decisions. So... I mean, that would make sense. Keep in mind that originally this... I, I think those cutscenes were originally released on the PS1 release. So, I mean, you're not even talking about a DVD worth of storage. Yeah, yeah. Um, Talking about like a CD, maybe. So I don't know. I think after this, I'll probably Google around and find some more people that have probably like Zelda, you know, have written like these deconstructions on um, Chrono Trigger and what was working and all that. Um, that's my that's that's my take there on that. Um, I'm gonna shotgun news items. Um, <clears throat> so so uh, speed round here. I'm going to give a shout-out. There'll be a link in show notes to Chainsaw Buffet podcast. Uh, 
John did an interview with Aaron Fitzgerald, um, which she's doing uh, a voice in uh, a couple voices, right? No, a voice in Persona 4. She's a character in Persona 4, right? Yeah. Um, but also a couple other games, Skull Girls and stuff like that. So um, you, you've probably played some of the games that she's in. So pretty good interview up there. That's what we're just checking out, just fandom. Uh, indie Games Uprising 3. In fact, next week will be our 100th episode, and we will have Dave Boyles and uh, Michael Hicks, uh, the guys kind of behind the scenes this year that are going to um, deal with all the administrative duties uh, to get that up. But um, do they have the games page? The games are announced. Uh, it was not updated there on that page, but the, there have been some news announcements, and they got the trailer out. The trailer is pretty amazing. It does. It looks really good. These these look like a really good... Um, I'm going to ask them how they ended up picking, because uh, like I said, when we talked about this before, my preference was, look, you seem to have a small private committee do the selection. This cannot be by community. Uh, that just leads to too many, you know, um, watering down, it felt like. Um... Dream Build Play. So we were supposed to in August, like, know the finalists. But I think this is a stealth update. I think they went in and changed the rules because I swear to not say this. I swear this segment in the judging process said, hey, in early August, no explicit date given, but in August, we will let you know the 20 finalists. And then in September, we will announce the the four winners, right, of each, of Xbox and and. Ten finalists in each, four winners in each. Xbox and Windows Phone. But now it says announcement of the contest finalists and the contest winners will be posted on the psych about the week of September 2nd. I Supposedly, um, finalists have already been notified, though, right? Yes. Rumor has it that if you were a finalist, you got an email. I saw that on Twitter. I can't remember who. We didn't get an email. Yeah. Um... Windows 8 games coming to Windows 8, and they'll have achievements. The reason I have this up here, uh, because I kind of tweeted this now, is to understand that Xbox Windows games is a thing. Xbox Windows games are PC games. They are not Xbox ports that run on the PC. Not an emulator of Xbox on the PC. It's not games that run on Xbox. But now this is the new... Xbox is the branding... That's going to overtake games for Windows Live. So everything's going to be called Xbox. This, this to me, just seems like a massive stupidity in branding. This because, is going to be market confusion. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Xbox is already so closely associated with the hardware that um, Xbox, the music service, Xbox, the video download service, Xbox, you know, um, the, the breakfast cereal, you know, like this, that's not working. Right? That's going to create a Xbox, lot. Xbox has got electrolytes. Um, speaking of Xbox, Microsoft GM was a uh, general manager of that thing, and he was like, we're really proud about our upcoming um, new products with our new Windows 8 and our new phone and our new Xbox coming. And everybody was like, aha, you know, Microsoft has confirmed they're working on the next Xbox. And no somebody kidding. else pointed out, like, hey, look, the new Xbox is due out by 2014, according to a job posting that went up. Like, hey, you know, you need to work on this Dick's console and get it out in 2014. So it's all official. It's all real. And then Microsoft goes, no, no, that was a misunderstanding. That We never said that's not what we meant. What he meant to say by new Xbox was the new dashboard. Because that's how everybody describes the new dashboard. They call it the new Xbox. It's a new Xbox experience. And of course, you know, those things come along. If he said experience, then we would have known it was a dashboard. And you know, those things only come along like once every two years. Yeah. Right. And but that's not the new Xbox. That's the new the Xbox thing is, experience. Like, thing is, well, yeah, but 2012, the 2014. The worst fucking kept secret all over the place. And yet they still are going to go through the effort to deny their shit. You know? Also, in the same vein... Um, they had like, this is like trying to pretend there's a Santa when your kids reach their teenage years. Yes, you're just a t- 19 year old kid about Santa. It. You know, it's like no, no. Um, there was you know all these leaked shots of of the new dashboard. I think this was on or something, or I don't know, Avatar Marketplace. Somewhere there was leaked shots of the Xbox with dollar prices. 
with actual wow. dollar prices instead of points. And everybody's like, yes, confirmed. You know, the rumors are true. They're going to get away from Microsoft points. And Microsoft came out and said, no, 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 that was an error. And we're correcting that. Seriously? Why the fuck would that error ever be possible? Like, I mean, just think about this. Think about the string formatting that goes into dollar sign zero point ninety nine and eighty MSP. You know, we we didn't have the symbol, like we didn't have a copy of of those assets, so we couldn't use them because they've never been used anywhere before. Yes, we just we just that little like weird like circle with a line in it thing that wasn't available to us, so we. Part of me, like, with all these leaks, like, I don't care because it will be what it will be. You will believe there is a Santa or you get no gifts. Yeah. <laughs> Did you change your um, Battle.net WoW password, Dylan? Not yet, but I haven't logged in in forever. Yeah. So we're in stage two. Stage one was like, well, we, we, yeah, something they hacked, but they didn't get anything. Now we're in stage two. Okay, so yes, they got a bunch of shit, but it's encrypted. My favorite fucking quote. My favorite quote is... <laughs> Um. Uh, where where is? I don't even think I have a current credit <coughs> card on mine, and I'm using a uh, key pass, so it's a unique password. Uh. Oh shit. Okay, maybe I don't have it. I'm gonna open a new tab here real quick. Uh, blah 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 blah. Okay, I love this line. We also know that cryptographically scrambled versions of the Battle.net passwords, not the actual passwords, for players on the North American servers were taken. We use secure remote password protocol to protect these passwords, which is designed to make it extremely difficult to extract the actual passwords and also means that each password would have to be deciphered individually. Unless, you know, someone had a table. Well... You would always fucking decipher each password individually. Every yes. password cracking scheme that has ever come forth would de pass would would decrypt them individually. Like that is just bullshit PR spin of like that's somebody who doesn't understand what happens. Yeah. So next step will be okay. So maybe they've decrypted this information. <laughs> that's the next step in. The, this very familiar uh, leak pattern uh, that developed. Hey, the Ouya closed with 8.5 million, 60,000 backers. Um, okay, I'm just going to say 60,000 people is not a wide install base. That is, that is they're going to need a shit more ton of those sold to be attractive. And I know it's a Kickstarter phase, but that thing isn't going to launch until March if it stays on target. We need... 300,000, I think, for this to be a viable platform target for people to get interested in. Yeah. Not counting the Android open hack. Yes, you can know you can't pirate it, but it's all open hackable. Yeah. Um, but that's where that ended up. Guess what Amazon's doing? What is Amazon doing? They're making fucking video games. Like, Amazon Game Studio. That's a thing. I know they did an Amazon movie thing a while back. Yes. And I never never heard any, any like movies to come of that. Uh but Amazon Amazon uh Game Studio and they've just debuted Living Classics, a new hidden object game on Facebook. So it's going to look like this is going to be the low end social gaming. I'm going to say this is Amazon leveraging the power of their um cloud services. Yeah. Of like, yeah, we can do some cloud gaming and get some new revenue there. Um and also, you know, Amazon I think they're one of the companies that allow their uh, developers to kind of play around. And then, like, yeah, go take that public, you know. Go ahead and, and do that. No, that's fine. Um, Facebook is getting into gambling. Why just let Zynga have it? No, I was going to say, not Zynga on Facebook, no. but Facebook, Facebook itself. Now, they're only doing this in the UK, where this kind of stuff is legal, legal. and they're launching, like, bingo frenzy. So. Okay. The next step for but them from there money, is to go money. into China and do Mahjong. Uh, Steam is expanding into non-games. Kind of like how they have Indie Game the movie and you can download game soundtracks? No. Like, buy apps. Huh. Specifically, they called, like, productivity apps. 
which is always code word for office. But <laughs> yes. Now, they haven't announced what apps, but they did give it a date, September 5th. So very quickly, you'll be able to do this. We'll see what they mean by apps in there. But these apps they were talking about are updated with the Steam API and will update like all your other Steam stuff. So uh, I'm mixed on this. One, there's a gamer side that argues, I don't want, you know, fucking apps on there. But because this is Steam, and I think Steam gets that, I think this is going to be just like a, a little tab thing. And, like, there'll be an apps tab, and it will be mixed in in any way, shape, or form. Like, you'll go to, like, Steam apps, and, you know, the the color of... If they do it right, the whole color of the app will probably go from black to white or something. Or they might even have a separate app that, you know, you can install on your office... Maybe that just does those apps or something. I think they're going to want to leverage their current install base uh, yeah. with the with the rollout. But the other side of me kind of likes the idea because like it just keeps all the shit up to date and it fuck it works. Um, what I think is interesting is what does this do to the Windows 8 store? Actually, I was just thinking about that because that would considering Valve's statement about Windows 8, like, yeah, we don't like it. Oh, it puts all that in a new light, doesn't it? It's almost like they're hedging their bets on Linux, but they're also hedging their bets by being the app store for Windows desktop. They keep telling Microsoft, just just buy into us. Let us do the Steam what you run want XP? to do. The Steam run on XP? XP? I do not know. Why would uh, that... Well, because... I mean, XP still has a giant star stall base, and Microsoft right. left that behind. Um, but they, of course, they run on Vista and Seven, which Windows Eight Store does not run on. And so now you have this Windows Eight's going to have this problem of like, well, yeah, I could put myself in the Windows Eight Store, and I have to write to your Metro platform, and like then I so not only uh, it's not Metro anymore. Yeah, the non whatever formerly known as Metro framework, right? To be in the store, because otherwise <laughs> it's just going to give you a link, right? It's like, here's a link to, you can be in the database and you can come up in searches, but you can't actually get the whole, like, we'll download, let updates to the system and all that, like, take care of all the install and give you a check for all the revenue and handle it. Now, to get all that, your app has to be written in WinRT. Um, so, if I write in WinRT, I only fucking run in 8. I only run in Windows 8. Right? Even though I'm just doing a desktop app, if I want to be in the Windows 8 store, it's got to be Windows RT if I want them to handle all the payment processing and all that. Or I could use whatever the hell I fucking want and not only run on Windows 8, but Vista and 7 and maybe XP. I don't know if Steam runs on XP. But I could have this big, large install base that's already out there. It's battle-tested. And, you know, the beauty is, like, Steam... Valve are much better aligned to take care of the marketplace and the environment than Microsoft. Microsoft, at the end of the day, makes money off of Windows and Office. Right. Valve makes money off the cut of the sales going through Steam. They make money off of selling their own games, but that's almost taken like a backseat to Steam. Look at Team Fortress 2. Like Team Fortress 2 became a Steam loss leader. Like, TF2, you know, we'll experiment with the free-to-play, but that's, like, stupid shit, you know? Um, TF2, full-on free, download it, it comes with Steam, it's free, there you go, rock on. Um, so, they have a much tighter interest into making the store the best possible fucking store. So that means, like, running on all platforms, um, you know, making it sure it's curated, making sure it's all done. Microsoft, on the other hand, they want to sell Windows. So the store reflects the fact that they really make money off a copy of Windows 8. And that's really what they're after. And you know the interesting thing about this is um, it kind of sidesteps around some of the issues that people have had with um, the the Mac App Store and, you know, obviously the coming you know, Windows 8 is... This is a third-party app store. They're not going to lock you down. They're not going to, you know, they're just going to sell you apps. So, basically, they compete by doing better, not by blocking out, you know, not by, hey, we've got gate Gatekeeper. It's going to help keep you secure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So, um, last two articles are basically go read on your own time, but there's a pretty good um, Cliff Pazinski um, on Garma Sutra of, of game developer flashcards, he calls them, but they're essentially like 20 
19 bad behaviors, one good behavior uh, that he's seen a lot for developers uh, communicating and resolving conflict among each other. And this really goes beyond just game development. Some of the things are very game development specific, yeah. but they really can kind of be applied to all development. Uh, the one good one, it's funny because I reference, I do this all the time. Um, although I don't describe it the same way. He, he called it the gardener which is the one that slowly tends their viewpoint and slowly over time until like no one remembers where the idea came from, but now everybody's talking about it and it gets implemented. And this is actually kind of the right way to, you know, get buy-in and slowly do this. And I've always talked about planting seeds that grow into mighty oaks, you know, and I'm, I'm always like sowing my tiny little seeds all over the company by leaving a little comment here, leaving a little comment here and all of that. And like when the oak grows, I'm not the one introducing the feature request somebody else is but i've kind of been nudging them in that direction but it's also partly because i want that person to understand what the need of the feature is and what it's really going to do right. so if i walk in there and just spell it all out you're putting too your much vision at once. on it i'm pushing a little bit there's kind of a natural reaction they don't quite get it and it might die so if i just like you know tease a little bit of like yeah, it'd be funny if we used, you know, the iPad to, like, do this stuff, you know? And then, you know, later, you know, you talk about, like, you know, hey, check this app out. You know, do this kind of swipe thing. Would it be cool if our, like, inventory came up that way or something? And then you, like, you know, over time, all of a sudden, like, can't we just put R? Like, how hard would it be if we did this to that app? And you're like, yeah, not hard at all, you know? Like, I got a prototype. I played around with that the other day or something. But, um, yeah, I've always called it, like, planting these seeds that grow into oaks, um, yeah, you know, sometimes it doesn't work, but that's, that's kind of a good way, but it's a good article, it's a good read. Uh, the other good read is, that was on Gama Sutra, uh, Keith Moore wrote up, like, getting the most from your sound designer, and basically this was a good how to communicate with a, um, sound designer of, like, you know, I, alright, you want me to come up with sounds for your game, you need a, gun, a sound for a freeze ray, you know, Okay, he's the sound designer. Okay, what should a freeze ray sound like? And like, I don't know, freeze ray. Like, what does, you know, can you describe it? Can you come out a little bit? And he talks about, like, this is somebody he had to pull with it, but eventually they said, well, it should sound organic and, you know, have, like, a, 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 a ice, like, getting hard and then cracking, you know, type thing. And he's like, now, great. I have a solid, you know, goal. Like, I'm going organic. That means no funny, you know, Just, you mystical know. effects and sounds and wubs and woo, 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 you know, none of that and all that. Just kind of like a, a hard densening and all that. And so now I can go out to do that. And he's basically like, I sent him the first episode, the thing, and they're like, oh my god, that's not exactly what I had in mind, but that is wonderful and we're going to use it, you know. So it's a good article to read as far as like how to work with a sound person. Because um, you've got to give them information uh, to get back something you're going to be happy with. Well, I mean, it's, I assume it's like working with a visual designer, except I think most people have a better language for describing right. something visually. Right, I think visually. it's an easier leap to go from developer to how do I talk to a designer than it is to how do I talk to a sound engineer. Because sound is, and he points this out, neglected a lot of times until the very end of the game. All right, let's do a Kickstarter lightning run here. Um, handful of Kickstarters this week. First one up, uh, Gianna Sisters. And uh, I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, this basically was that Super Mario Brothers clone. That that Super Mario Brothers? Which one? Gianna Sisters. Uh, okay. The Super Gianna Sisters or whatever they were called. Uh, they were like a direct clone, like pretty blatant clone, to the point where Nintendo forced uh, them to come off the market. And they were released on PC. Because basically Nintendo doesn't release PC games. So like Super Mario Brothers was crazy popular. Um, and everybody wanted, uh, you know, like talk of like who put it on the PC. So these guys blatantly rip it off. There's like Gianna and her sister um, Marie. You know, they're even like Italian names and all that. Like they just went down carte blanche. Everything works the same. They're not coins or diamonds. They're not, you know, whatever. They're this. Um, but yeah, to all the behavior. So Nintendo basically did threaten them. Didn't no actual like lawsuit, but just threatened them, and they took it off the market. Uh, included like a port they had to another console. Like it like completed a port to um, Zen Station or something. I don't know what it was. 
And then they actually released a Gianna Sisters DS. Okay? So basically the, the, the guys behind it, like, then, like, took this idea of a platform with these two girls and kind of, like, kept some things, like, they collect diamonds and all that. But original the level design now, original favor, and, you know, Nintendo's like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, release on the DS. So you can get a Gianna Sisters DS version. And now, basically, this Kickstarter is um, for a new platformer of the Diana Sisters. And, you know, this one actually kind of has, um, well, it has, like, these little, like, creepy uh, Furby-looking things in it. Um, <laughs> but of course it does. This, this uh, the whole idea here is that you um, can easily toggle between the two world states of, like, the Nightware world or the Candy world. And when you do that, you flip between the sisters, and the, the sisters have different powers. And so at the beginning, you know, like, you know, oh, come to this bridge. Ah, oh, I can't jump across that. I'll flip it. No, I can't run across that, you know. And then eventually they talk about where those get to the point where, like, you're going to be mid-air doing flips and changes to get through, you know, uh, things, you know, flip, flip back, do this, grab that, flip back, do this, you know, grab that and all that. Uh, it looks really well. Um, it's very far complete in development. In fact, uh, it's rocketed funding you know it's got like 60 grand already um they uh basically say like hey we want to finish this game and get it out because we've run out of development money on it so the, the studio would have to take contract work now i'm like that's just like fucking game dev story uh so we'd have to take <laughs> contract work to get some money in so we could finish the game but uh we don't want to do that so we're going to try kickstarter to see if we can get the money to go ahead and finish the game and get it out there the next NES area reboot is Cheetah Man. Uh, what? I am not a hundred percent. It's just they guy. They have the angry video game nerd in their Kickstarter. Uh, he doesn't actually add a lot to a Kickstarter. So it's kind of in my the humor doesn't play. It really backfires. Um, now, unfortunately, they don't. I think what the idea is. It's not heavily communicated but this is a very rare Nintendo card I don't think there was a lot of them uh, and the, the game essentially was this broken platformer so it shipped broken you get to like a certain stage and the game locks up and you can't finish the game and it's like legend status or something uh, you know so a lot of people talk about it and getting your hands on it is a very big deal I'm trying to see if there's the gameplay footage uh, but, so the idea behind this Kickstarter is that these guys are going to fix it and re-release it. Like the actual source code, or are they going to re it? I don't forget the source code, but they do have the studio that owns it behind the project. Okay. Um, so they do have that. The creator has passed away, so he's, he's not alive anymore. But, uh, yeah, this guy, um, I don't, he has no involvement with the original project, but he is going to redo the new project. Um, is going to just, you know, fix it and relaunch it. So, I'm not quite sure. They're, they got $30,000 because, you know, this thing has a nostalgia value. But why they need $65,000? Like, it seems like if you get the game, um, get it. Are they making carts? <laughs> Um, maybe that's it. Maybe they're actually issuing. If they issue carts that I can plug into my Nintendo or yes, idiot. yes, they are. Hell yeah! <laughs> so that explains why this is going so well. Uh, next up is uh Soul Forge digital card trading game. Now this is going to be a mobile app, and normally these don't do well, and you know I pass on them. This one's already up to almost ninety thousand of its two hundred fifty thousand, and that's because the creators of Ascension and Magic the Gathering um, are on this project. Uh, Richard Garfield. Yeah, Richard Garfield. I I misread this as Richard Garrett, and that's why I was like, holy shit, let me like, who the fuck's Richard Garfield? I thought it was Richard Garrett. But I'm not a Magic the Gathering Still guy. Still kind of legendary. But apparently, like, he's, like, the godfather of, you know, CCG games. Um, and and so, uh, they got this other studio that did Invention. They got him, uh, Richard, on there. Uh, and, and he gives a lot of props to Ascension. 
It's like, hey, I like this game. It's a good fan. I love it. You know, glad to work with you guys. All that kind of thing. So um, they essentially Soul Forge is a game that you can play, or maybe that's not. I, I, don't, I don't know. know. I don't they know. seem that to have like a, something that I've played. They before. seem to have it designed already, and this is about getting it on iOS and getting the iOS game that these guys want. So these guys don't feel that collectible card games have been done right on um, mobile platforms yet. So they want to take their touch at it. So it's no surprise that this thing is getting crazy funded uh, and supported, even though it is an iOS platform game. Um, the Adventures of Shadow Cat. This is on here as a warning to others. Um, basically, this is a comic book that you have mini games inside of. Oh, dear Lord, no. So you're going to read the comic book. The animation to the comic book does not look great. Um, let's let's get here. Yeah, so um, that scene actually doesn't look half bad. Most of the comic book stuff. Come on, they actually had no, no. These are yeah, the actual frames are like web comic level, right? Bad so web comic. I I nothing not knocking web comics, but. People who collect comic books are into the art. You know, like, that's a big piece of it. And they talk about the artist and the art and just look over that and just love staring at it. And then, like, these these are not panels that you stare at. These are web comics, you know. These are read the three panels and chuckle and then wait for the next episode next week, you know. Um, but the thing I think is going to kill this, and it's not getting funded at all, is that they just launch with, like, our patent-pending technology of, you know, mini games and comics. And I think that's just, like, backfiring. I think there's just, like, a... Oh, so you're one that are out there, like, patented gameplay rules and all that and gonna, like, you know... Like, what is it that Nintendo has a patent on? That D-pad. No, like, the start no. menu or something. They have, like, the way the start menu works or something. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, like the Wii start menu? No, oh, no, like, the press, NES era, the, the like... The NES era, press start to play. Yeah, press start to play or something, and, you know, um, I, I forget. There's some process, like, Nintendo games do to launch in the game, I thought, and that the other games don't do, and there's, like, a patent. I could be wrong on this. There, there is, like, patents on the controller. There is, like, patents on a D-pad, and so, you know, like, everybody has to come up with the other ways of doing D-pads. Um, stupid shit. And so, yeah, I think, like, gamers, like, from that shit pretty much are, are not into, like, patents on their games. They don't want to fund a patent troll. When you launch your Kickstarter and say, our patent-pending technology, nobody wants to fund and encourage. I think the intent, when you say patent-pending, is, like, it's new, it's cool, it's different, but, yeah. It's backfired in this case. Um, also, this has a case of, like, here is this... Attractive female. She's listed as executive producer, and she very well may be an artist or something like that. But they have her read the entire, you know, cue cards, and it's very obvious she is just looking at the cue cards. So it's not quite as bad as like the hired model reading the cue cards because she is some way related to the project. But it's very wooden read, and it just feels like, okay, there's probably more enthusiastic people on your team. You probably should have let them talk about the game. Or maybe they just, you know, shouldn't have done cue cards. Yeah. She's just not good on camera. Um, Hyper Stegtendo Stegtendo Siblings. Uh, this is a platformer that just has, has a novel idea. I don't know that it looks that interesting in the gameplay footage. But essentially the idea here um, is the Seg. There's a brother and sister, and they get sucked into the Segtendo, and now, like, um, they have to play their games. It would be good, I think, if this thing got into, like, it's a platformer. Now it's an RPG. Now it's a match three. You know, <laughs> like, now it rift on all these game genres. But it's so far... Oops, sorry about that, listeners. Um, but it so far seems to be a, um, just a platformer. 
Um, so if, it looks kind of Yoshi story ish. It if it expanded a bit, it could be interesting. As a platformer, it doesn't seem to have launched strong out of the gate, but it does get a thousand dollars. So, you know, there's that Kickstarter thing. Like, you know, if you hit twenty percent, you're likely to be funded. So they they may still get funded. Um, next one is Flight of the Wisp. This one is that uh, the ten percent funding. Um, so uh, this looks pretty interesting. This is a puzzle PC game where you, it's a 3D puzzler, you play like this ball of energy that, you know, is kind of free to move about the environment, but like as you interact with other things of energy, you take on their powers and then that will let you get to, you know, unlock uh, and get that. And, and kind of like, what was the name of the game? Like uh, Flow? What was the name of the game? The one where you're playing know. Liquid. And that you move like through the game like it's a kind of a physics puzzler, and you play liquid, and you get the liquid to move throughout the entire game. But like as your liquid like touches other things, it changes property, like you so become it becomes more viscous or becomes thinner, you know, and has different property uh, to it. I think I've played it. I want to say it was in a humble bundle uh, at some point. So it kind of reminds me of that. Not in that it's like this liquid, but just in that kind of like casual puzzling game they even put that in the description this is like a casual laid back take your time solve not not time pressure um as opposed to like a 3d puzzle like portal which gets like yeah there's a puzzle aspect to it but it does get into reflexes later in the game uh this one's not going to get funded but i'm calling out drug lord rts the video game and this is funny because, like, these guys aren't getting a whole lot of funding and everything like that. They're looking for $420,000. Ha ha, get that? Um, and they start off the thing, and they're like, hey, we're a successful studio. And we made Deer Hunter. And all these poker games. And these licensed magic games that were kind of crap. And it's like, we Wait, are... licensed Magic the Gathering? Magic the Gathering. But he's not holding up, like, the XBLA one or something like that. Like, he's holding up this, like slimline PC case one that you get like on the $5 rack at Walmart. Magic Battlegrounds? I don't know. I don't know. He flashes it really quick. Uh, I think the thing is to be able to say Magic the Gathering before you realize like, what? I've never heard of that version. Um, so, and you know, he talked about they did um, a bibble dibble dabble or something and he's like, it's like words with friends but awesome. You should check it out. I'm like, oh my god, you guys are cloning Zynga, and you're advertising that you're cloning Zynga. Um, I think this is really backfiring. Also, you're not funny in your attempt at humor. Also, you have no pictures of the game. Just this idea of, like, we think it'd be funny if you had an RTS, but you were a drug lord, so you were just trying to, you know, raise and sell drugs. As is this a bad game that already exists? Probably it does. Seems like that kind of meme Sounds would. Sounds like Mafia Wars does seem very close to that. Um, I don't know if this is going to be funded. So they're looking for $70,000. But Expedition's Conquistador is um, a tactics style RPG. So it's not just the fights. It is kind of a tactics RPG set in uh the, the colonial Spanish conquering of, of, of Middle and South America, right? So, you know, you're up against, like, Aztecs and things like that, and a lot of historical-based fact. I mean, it kind of looks like it hits, like, some uh, Civ points, and it hits, like, this JRPG tactics points, you know, you know the Civ with, like, the historical context and things like that. Um, it looks like this could be interesting you know the game looks you know playable and they got demos up and you know they'll be able to pull it off i wonder if they'll hit seventy thousand dollars for it though because it does look niche you know this looks yeah. like this is going to appeal to a certain audience and i wonder if that audience is going to get them seventy thousand dollars and an audience that... but they're up to 10 and they have 32 days to go so odds are in their favor at this point yeah, and an audience, like you said, with Civ, there are other games, but not many, that, that fill that niche. Um, this one has a much more reasonable $15,000, um, although they've only attracted $500, and I think that's because people may not 
look into this deeply or again it's going to appeal to a a niche audience but yeah so this is um an rpg <clears throat> kind of a, a tactical um uh, rpg but the thing is is like it's going to come with the full like editor map editor script engine like create your own world uh, it looks very boxy here like it's a voxel engine i'm not sure that it actually is um but you are not placing voxels in the map this is a a it, yeah, here right now here in the, the video this is a deform like place things raise lower mountains that kind of uh terraforming it seems uh, very tile based as yes opposed it, to... it does look tile based um but it looks like it has a pretty interesting editor um, and that, you know, you'd be able to create some interesting games with it. It does look like it's going to have the horsepower there uh, to create uh, something powerful. So, uh, you know, like I said, it's five, about $465, $500 of $15,000. Um, you know, of course, they got like 30 days to go. This may or may not hit their mark, but um, it does look like a good project. It looks like it's pretty far along. Um, We'd like to see that one succeed. Last one um, is really kind of a how to botch an attempted, like, hey, I'm famous developer or famous studio or we did something successful relaunch. So her interactive that does the Nancy Drew games, which have some popularity and some success, you know, they they do. Um, and, and, you know, they've always been award women, you know, winning and, you know, all that. And Nancy Drew is a great empowerment character and all that. It's great. They're like, hey, we should put these on the iPad and the mobile apps now. Because, like, they're that kind of adventure games and they would work well. But they're really pitching the idea for a quarter of a million dollars. We're going to port them. We're going to take our existing games and port them over. So it's like, okay, so you're, you're just going to redo the interfaces Probably end up with some ports that don't work well. Uh, you don't have any prototypes up um, of like, you know, we can leverage the iPads, new, you know, things like this and add these features and add social networking and, you know, put the stuff in. They don't really get into that if they are planning it uh, in the video. And then also I'm thinking like they in the backing levels um, at the $25 level. Uh, you get, um, you know, copy of the, a mobile game, but uh, 25% off the the PC versions of, of the games that you could digitally download. And I'm thinking, like, Bullshit. you need to throw those in. Yeah. Those you can give away to fund your Kickstarter. Um, uh, this whole, like, giving coupon codes for discounts for me to go buy the other Nancy Drews. Like, you should go in there and go, like, okay, guys. 75 bucks, Nancy Drew Collector's Edition. Here's all the PC Nancy Drews, and you'll get the mobile game when it comes out. Because Even though I don't like the idea of the port, I'd buy that for my daughters. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's probably going to get a lot more sales, I would imagine. I may be wrong about this. In a mobile app store than it would in a PC, because those have those have been out for a while. Um, they have been. That's what I mean. These are not new cutting-edge games. I know yeah. there's a number of them, but... Steam bundles, man. Like, Steam sale and Steam bundles have devalued my view of, like, no, 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 you wrap up your entire fucking studio's history and you sell it to me for 25 bucks. Maybe twenty nine ninety nine, but definitely not more. You know, yeah. like, you asked for forty nine ninety nine, like the, uh, the Ubisoft bundle, which is fucking an amazing number of fucking games. You know, new ones and all that. I'm like, $40. Wow, $49.99. Fuck, fuck you, fuck you, Ubi. I'm not going to pay that for all your latest games, you know, in one bundle. The price that you sell a new game at. Um, so that's kind of devalued <laughs> that, and I think they should restructure that. I also think they need to, like, hey, we want to bring Nancy Drew to the iPad with this new adventure. Not this, we want to port our old games because they're great over. Because uh, then I'm like, why do you need two hundred fifty thousand dollars for that? Um, that? That's not a horrible goal, but it's not a two hundred fifty thousand dollar goal. No, no, it's not. It's it's not, and it's something that I don't even know if you need a Kickstarter for, to be honest. All right, so that wraps up uh, Kickstarters for the week. 
Um, next week, like I said, we're going to have our 100th episode, and we're going to have uh, some of the guys behind the uh, Indie Uprising 3. Um, also, appearing sometime soon. I, I don't know the date. I know I'm recording Sunday. Uh, I don't know the date that it'll be uploaded, but I will be on the Casual Sunday Gamer podcast. Uh, this is one of the ECMO podcasts that we launched uh, a few weeks back. Uh, uh, not not us personally. We had the guys who were launching it on our podcast who talk about their new podcast. So uh, I'm going to be on there and talk more about Kickstarter. So if you've listened to our Kickstarter edition, uh, probably a lot of the same, but I may ask some more questions on that. So just a plug for them. They're not in the iTunes yet. They don't have that set up and working, I think. Uh, or maybe they are. Or by the time you're listening to this, it's there. they or something. Yeah, they got to get in there. They hadn't submitted um, but I think they submitted the other day or so, so they may not have appeared up. But if you just Google casual Sunday gamer, it comes right up the first hit. So just, you know, click on that and that's it. So, uh, once again, thank you everyone for, uh, who tuned in the live show and watched. Uh, thank you anybody who, you know, watches this, uh, video on YouTube or, you know, of course, old school downloads and gets us, uh, through iTunes, uh, and RSS and listens to, to audio podcasts. But we will be back in a week.